All right, it looks like we are right at a quarter after, and I'm going to go ahead and get started so Janet can have all of her time. I am not going to introduce myself. I think you've seen me enough to know who I am at this point. Um, so welcome to day two of Blossom. If this is the first ses session you're joining us for today, welcome, welcome. I just want to remind everyone that we do have a hashtag for event, and I have seen uh, quite a bit of activity on Twitter. I haven't checked other social media, um, but if you are a sharer, this is the hashtag we're using. I think most of you know by now to use the panel at your right to um, express your questions and chat with your fellow attendees. Just click on that chat tab in that panel to take you to the chat session. Everyone is automatically muted, so no fear that you will become unmuted accidentally. If you have a question, Janet, please use the Q&A panel so that it does not get lost in chat. Um, if you've been in these before, you can see that it goes pretty quickly. We've easily had over a thousand pe people in every session. We are providing closed captioning. Um, so if you would like to access closed caption, you can go to nlm.gov slash blossomcc to access those captionings. And just a reminder that we do have a code of conduct for this uh, event. I think we're all professionals, so this won't be too much of a hardship. Um, but we are dedicated to harassment-free conference experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender, gender identity and expression, age, sexual orientation, disability or ability, physical appear body appearance, <clears throat> body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or lack thereof, or technical choices. And a quick word about who we are um, before we get into today's class. You may have seen these um, abbreviations before, but may not be familiar with who, what they stand for. NIH is the National Institutes of Health, and it's the nation's leading medical research agency. Right now, you might be more familiar with the Center for Allergies and Infectious Diseases, where Dr. Fauci is the director. It is one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. The National Library of Medicine, NLM, is also an institute at NIH. It is the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources such as PubMed and Medline Plus. And NLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine, and it is a network that is for all libraries. It is an outreach program of NNLM, I'm sorry, of NLM. And that brings us down to the RMLs, or regional regional medical libraries who lead programs, funding, and other outreach initiatives in their regions and nationally. And with that, I am going to go ahead and get off the stage and stop sharing my screen and hand things over to Janet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bobby. Just thank you so much for creating space for this phenomenal conference. Um, I'm going to invite um, my technical support to share my slide deck. Um, we had a little bit of a uh, snafu, so I'm just excited to have that support as well. Um, my name is Janet Damon. I'm the Library Service Specialist for Denver Public Schools. I'm also the co-founder with three other BIPOC librarians, as well as LGBTQIA, um, who founded Afros and Books. I have one of my uh, sister librarians in the chat, Talia Abdullah from Apaho Library District. And um, I'm also the co-lead for the Women of Color um, in Colorado, it's an affinity group that is inclusive, and um, as well as I, I write a blog, the Cultural Mothers here in Denver called Mixed Mama. So my Twitter is Mixed Mama. Um, it's two X's. I, I might have missed that up, but anyhow, um, I'm just excited today to share with you affinity spaces, and um, this is all rooted in work that I have done as a racial justice organizer back in the 1990s that gave me a praxis around building community wherever I am. So I'll go ahead and take us to the next slide. The greeting that I offer you today is Sawubona. Sawubona is a greeting that is rooted in the um, Zoo tradition of South Africa. It means that I see you. I see you, your gifts and your needs. You are important to me and I see you. The response to this is Shikoba. Shikoba means I am here. And if you see me, then I am happy or grateful to know that I exist for you. And it is in this space where we can be authentic and um, vulnerable and show our strengths and as well as our uh, needs. And that in that space, we come together and we can truly see each other and come in to exist for one another. And until that happens, until there is space for storytelling and for authenticity, we truly may not exist for each other in the ways that matter. 
Next slide. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about benefits and the power of belonging and connection and creating space for this in your organization. Um, it's, it's about the benefits of prioritizing affinity groups, shifts that organizations can make to support affinity groups, and then what are some examples of events and workshops and partnerships that you can use as well. We'll go to the next one. So um, when we think about uh, belonging, I'm gonna tell you first a story of othering. Once upon a library conference um, I attended, I was viscerally surprised, but I shouldn't have been probably surprised when um, as I was going through it, I noticed I didn't see a lot of other folks that look like me. And, you know, by the middle of the day, um, I had gone into kind of, let me pull people together. Let me find uh, my community. Let me create community in this space. And so in that space throughout the day, I was gathering and introducing myself and um, um, pulling together a, a group that would be our own little makeshift, um, you know, on the spot affinity group. And so before it was over, we had had lunches and dinners and gathered together, talked about workshops, talked about presentations. Um, and, you know, even in the midst of that, there was um, some things that were coming up for people that they were experiencing at that conference, microaggressions, some extreme othering, in fact. And it made me really, truly realize how critical safe spaces for affinity groups and BIPOC uh, librarians are, are, should be built into our systems, recognizing um, that the demographics of libraries don't always support and um, help folks to maintain some longevity in this field. We'll go to the next slide. So in that, you know, I realized that we have to have, that this field is still 83% um, of librarians are white, only 5.3% of librarians identify as black or African-American, 7.1% uh, as Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, and 3.5% as Asian-American or Pacific Islander. So in light of what we know, how are we creating systems to support and retain and recruit um, uh, a more diverse presentation in the library field? We'll go to the next slide. So the benefits of affinity spaces um, really root down into, I see you, that Shikoba and, and Saul Bona, that um, I see the things that you bring to this work and this field, and I support you in that. Um, so we'll go to the next one if we can. And so those benefits, not only is it a space for, you know, promoting um, the professional development and your career growth, but it also builds friendships, promotes collaboration, establishes that community. It helps to sustain and accelerate career opportunities that amplify the brilliance of our colleagues. Um, it helps to support that inclusive workforce that benefits everyone. There's so much data around how important this is to, um, you know, even our, our when we think about our millennials, 53% have said that that's one of the top three things they look for when they are entering um, an organization is how diverse is it, and also ensures there's a greater set of complex skills and criticality at the table. So when your decision makers and your um, designers, your equity designers, and when your program designers um, have that diversity of thought and lived experience, it just makes for better decision making. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And so when we think of what organizations can do to support belonging, um, it's creating space first and inviting staff to become affinity group leaders, protecting their time being in gathering. Um, I think about, you know, in, in where I am in Denver, um, this is something that's embedded across our district. Um, I'm with a, um, a school district. And so with affinity groups, they offered a space for folks to determine what affinity groups they might want to lead. So we have, um, you know, a, a Latinx affinity group. We have an LGBTQIA affinity group. Um, I run, I co-lead the Women of Color affinity group, but there's also a deaf and hard of hearing affinity group. And, and so there's a single parents affinity group. So it's important to think about, you know, who is centered and who is marginalized in some of our spaces and to offer a space where people can um, lead in ways that affirm identity and also uplift some of the identities that um, have for a very long time not had their needs supported or addressed. Um, providing resources, thinking about 
What does it look like to fund this work? What does it look like to invest in um, those members to support their attendance at conferences, to support their presentations at conferences, um, to ensure that they have some of the skills around facilitation and leadership that, that prepare and promote their skills um, as they are they as they have career aspirations to be you know, promoted within the organization. Um, ensure that belong groups are offered during new staff onboarding. This is actually really important. Some of the folks who are um, brought, you know, recruited to organizations or invited um, to be a part of an organization might not know about some of the resources that are offered in, you know, whether it's human resources or whether it's through um, training opportunities. So having you know, an invitation to say these affinity groups exist within our organization and inviting folks to join as soon as they become um, a new employee in an organization will help them to navigate some of our other systems more readily and it reduces the amount of frustration they can have as they're just trying to figure things out. And it also allows just for relationships to be made early on as they're coming onto a, um, an organization so that People can lean in and offer mentorship opportunities. Um, you know, I, I think that the power in this is that this is how people have navigated really complex systems for a long time. It is through belonging and fellowship and, and gathering together to um, talk about these, these needs that folks have, you know, setting a space where people can be authentic about what they need. So, and it also is a space for affinity groups to gather to provide feedback to the organization. So one of the things that our um, LGBTQIA affinity group um, did in their advocacy was advocate for there to be data collection on one of our surveys that happens across our district, just asking um, how likely are you to still be with our organization in three to five years? What kinds of systems of support, you know, um, do you feel like would benefit um, you know, your, your affinity group. And so in those questions, a lot of that information that came back helped the organization to grow and to be more intentional about the affinity work. So in also thinking about too, when there are barriers that are built in to, um, you know, some of the you know, systems that we have in place, that feedback from affinity groups to the organization to help it grow is really critical. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit in the next slide about our Women of Color of Colorado Affinity Group. We'll go to the next slide. Um, this affinity group began, you know, first and foremost for folks who are in school libraries, in, you know, in education, teaching. It was kind of, you know, all of the folks that are in our organization. We have 6,000 employees. We serve 93,000 students. Um, but what also has developed is that, you um, it is inclusive. So we have folks from varying backgrounds, folks who are public librarians, folks who are um, in research libraries, folks who are in engineering and in other underrepresented fields. Um, and so when we founded the Women of Color Colorado group, we identified, you know, it's great to put together a founding statement that really articulates your mission and vision for what it is you want to do. And in different years, we have focused on different parts of this. So you know, one of the things was that we wanted to create a system of support for all of the employees of color to be able to connect with belong groups and for ours, the women of color group, we really wanted to focus on advancement, retention, support and development across departments and also, you know, provide professional development, trainings, mentorship, engagement activities. Um, we wanted to do this and create caring communities through the strategic use of text and email, meetups, events and programs for youth. And we wanted to collaborate with organizations outside of our own, um, pulling in facilitators to support with our ongoing development, things that are resonating with our members as we go. So we do a yearly survey. We do two, uh, one at the end of the year to ask folks what went well, and then one at the beginning of the year to say, where is our intentionality um, you know, going to be placed this year? Um, and so also engaging in social outings, health and wellness, um, that would that became really big during the pandemic is that people really wanted spaces for support around their mind um, mindfulness around you know just their mental health and um, how you know so much change was coming about so quickly how do we ad adapt and also honor our own way of being 
so that we're not kind of, um, um, you know, finding ourselves compartmentalizing in a response to, you know, the amount of, um, you know, the, the, the heaviness that was happening in the world. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next one. So one of the things, um, I do a newsletter, and when you get the slide deck, you'll get to see some of the examples of the newsletter. Um, in the newsletter, so here in this picture are some of our founding members of the Women of Color group. And um, for those of you who might recognize Julia Torres, she's the co-founders of Disrupt Text. She's also in our district. Um, and so it was a space that, you know, we definitely put together in our founding um, a newsletter that captured all of the celebrations, great projects and great leadership that um, Women of Color District is doing. And it was a place to celebrate and just amplify the work um, of our members. We can go to the next slide. And then also there's emails that go out about scholarship opportunities. Um, different um, events that people can, you know, participate in, social gatherings, all of those kinds of things that build that community. Go to the next slide. And I have a mini video, and this is going to try to capture because there's so many different things, but I just want to play a little bit of this, maybe a minute or so, so that you can see some of our um, some of the video, some of the pictures are pre-pandemic, but um, I can, we'll show you a little bit what we've done since uh, video is primed. We can play a little bit of that for you.
right, I'll go ahead and, and we'll thank you so much for sharing that and we'll go back to the slide deck. But you see that with, not everyone comes to everything, but we create tons of opportunity for folks to engage where um, feel like it, it aligns with their schedule and their time. But, you know, everything is shared out so people know they're a part of that community. And so um, I hope that gave you some ideas for ways that you can think about um, sharing and implementing um, some of those those events and gatherings. Um, I know that we're in a virtual space and I'll show you some of the things that we've done to adapt to that kind of virtual space. Um, I think we're on slide 13. We have quarterly meetings, so we're, we do gather for those. Um, and then, you know, we also, we can go to the next one. Um, We also do a lot of partnerships. So this was a partnership with the Black Hike, but um, we do partnerships with um, some of our uh, yoga studios, mental health providers. You know, we want to create lots of opportunities. We live in Colorado, so it's a beautiful state. There's plenty of opportunities to get out in nature. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And so we want to also just honor that, you know, we members can set up their own gatherings. So if a member says, like in the picture you'll see down below, um, one of our members wanted to just set up a book club, a summer book club. So we just promote that to everyone and then folks who want to engage. So in these kind of um, mini gatherings can do that, you know, or if someone has put together, they're having a special event and they just want to invite folks to come out and support them. Uh, those are both some in-person examples. The next one. And so virtually, we have set up um, virtual brunches where we just encourage members. We have like a, a recommended menu. If they want to order out and get some brunch from somewhere and bring it home and have a, a little virtual brunch or gathering, we have done those. Um, we've also had just virtual happy hours. Um, we have uh, opportunities sometimes. So the groups that joined our group is um, an affinity group from the um, Metropolitan State University, as well as University of Colorado Denver, they have their own affinity group. And one of our pre-COVID, our last gatherings was uh, they had an open um, like celebration of mindfulness and self-care that some of our members attended. And then afterwards, there's events that they will host. Um, so they're going to have like a choir present, um, present, presentation next week. So we're going to virtually attend some of those things together. Um, just so that we can chat and talk about what we're seeing. So there's still spaces to create belonging. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so um, one of the other things that's been really nice that we have attended um, virtual yoga sessions together. There's um, Satya Yoga is a BIPOC owned and led um, yoga um, cooperative that's here in Denver. Um, I think Talia Abdullah is actually also one of the yoga teachers who's been licensed through this program. And so there are spaces where we can also amplify to our members, you can become a licensed yoga teacher, a licensed mindfulness teacher, and then, you know, we can um, also participate in some of those activities together. And so we also invited um, the founder of Luna Vibrations, um, as Elisa Clark to host for us a, you know, um, it was a microaggressions, how to use mindfulness and how to use um, different techniques to address microaggressions in the workplace. And that session was a beautiful session. She also does sound bowl healing. Um, so, you know, these are, are, are wonderful examples of ways that um, people can share resources, experience some of these events together. And what was nice about the session is we also created a uh, self-care toolkit. So all of the members were invited to create one page of a um, Google slide deck and just tell us what are the ways that they're managing and coping and, and um, navigating the, these difficult times. But we also want to make sure that folks are aware of other resources around mental health. So um, we have one of our members is actually the founder of um, the Therapists of Color Collective here in Denver. Well, it's here in Denver, but I think you know, they are virtual services, so they, they can be offered nationwide. But so Rosina Santiago, sure, she is, you know, going to host for us too. Like, when do you know that you have 
have exhausted your toolkit and you really should be meeting with a licensed therapist to get some support around your mental health. So we want to destigmatize mental health, especially in communities of color, that it's a part of well-being and wellness to attend those sessions. And so um, she is a phenomenal resource. And so, you know, creating a spirit of reciprocity where you are having your organization um, invest in and support all of these incredible leaders and entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs of color in our communities, because oftentimes I've found in the women of the group, most women of color are carrying three different ways that they're manifesting leadership. They're leading in their organizations, but most are also doing some work in community and with social justice and with supporting um, beyond the scope of um, just the workplace. And then we have folks who are, are building up nonprofits. And so we really want to uh, create that kind of um, uh, connective tissue between our community so that we can uplift and amplify that all of that work that's being done. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, we have, so here's just an example of one of our sister circles um, just coming to share wisdom and knowledge. And I, I just think about the power of sharing, having a space to share your testimony and having a space for someone to witness your testimony. And I think that that um, oral tradition, that tradition of coming together in a safe space to talk about um, our journey and um, to share that is, is something that most organizations don't create space for, but that is truly the engine of um, resiliency and being able to feel connected to one another. And, you know, in those spaces where you're able to just put your burdens down and say, you know, it's hard when this has come up with this colleague multiple times and I haven't been able, like, you know, I have to do this education with my whole team around why this is a microaggression, why this is causing an, a psychologically unsafe space. And they also have to do the labor for them of showing them how they should be doing things differently. Like that's heavy work for someone to carry day in and day out. So having an affinity space where folks can process and also we have um, an eldership, we honor, the women who have been in our organizations for 20 plus years and have um, who have overcome a number of different uh, challenges and trials that you know younger women and, and are facing, and then they just they provide that continuity, like Sankofa circle of wisdom. Um, and so sometimes you know we'll put a question just to the whole wisdom circle of like seven elders that are in our district that. Um, you know, and just ask them, how do you deal with this? How do you cope with this? And then share that question and then, yeah, so they can share this um, with us. One of the ladies in this photo is um, Debbie Blair Mentor and her father, you know, these are founding people in our district who have schools named after them, who have led incredible journeys. I think about Lena Archuleta, an educator who was not only a librarian in our district, who was the first Hispanic um, Latina librarian, but she also was the first director of the Colorado Library Association, also the first Latina principal. And then even after retirement, she went back and, and um, got some extra classes so that she could lead AARP members and advocate for people to get retirement support, you know, in eldership. And so those stories and those testimonies, they can provide that fertile, resilient and sense of grounded in that ancestral kind of strength of those who have come before us. So, you know, in the affinity spaces, there is an opportunity to create that reciprocity um, and to have a, a, a circle where you can share those testimonies. We'll go to the next one. Um, so one of the things we also do, and, and both um, we have participated in the million um, the, the March for Women, the March for Black Women, um, participated in the, you know, uh, parade that happens here in honor of Martin Luther King. Um, we have participated in just recently in vigils to honor and stand in solidarity with um, our Asian community. And so we also recognize intersectionally that, um, that women especially are dealing with not only systems that are um, racist and white supremacist based systems, but they also have this double piece where they also are showing up and experiencing patriarchy within both um, in communities of color and in, um, in a white supremacist system. So we recognize that that is, you know, we have to stand in solidarity with women's um, 
you know, uh, identities as we have are navigating in a system that is rooted in male privilege. And we are also rooted in um, how we can stand for one another and be present for one another. So we spoke at the, um, the vigil here in Denver, Colorado, and um, our members were able to either you know, send letters of support or also attend if they felt comfortable. And if not, they can also see um, some of those uh, the sharing out in our newsletter that we were in representation of our um, women of color group. So we'll go to the next one. And so I, I wanna, um, in Sankofa, and also just to share some of the challenges and some of the learning that has taken place um, over the time of, of the four years that our group has been um, in existence. So one is that, you know, organizational accountability and integrity. So the organization has to hold some of these spaces in integrity, that this is not a performative space. It is not a checkbox to say, oh yeah, we have an affinity group. We resourced it, we don't provide time for people to attend it, we don't amplify it during our onboarding, we don't, that's performative. That's just saying, oh, we have one to have one. But if you want to have a true affinity space, you have resourced the individuals who are leading it, you have offered time for them to do planning to increase the, the likelihood that there'll be great opportunities and great, and time to create the newsletters, time to um, you know, organize events and all of those spaces will be valued um, and the resource and there'll be funding to provide opportunities. There is funding for us to provide uh, stipends to those who are presenting for us. We do not believe in um, BIPOC women doing unpaid um, presentations. We believe in resourcing and honoring them through um, paying for their time and honoring their wisdom and experience of lived experience as well as their um, technical skills as, you know, all of it. So, uh, you know, that's something that is a difference between something that's performative and something that is an integrity. Now, who is allowed in and who is not? So, you know, our group, we recognize anyone who self-identifies as a woman. And so that includes our trans sisters. And so, you know, we do not, um, I have seen other groups though where they were not rooted in who they allowed to kind of be in those spaces. And so there's a difference between um, an ally space or a, an alliance space. An alliance space would have BIPOC members as well as allies to your BIPOC members. Um, but an affinity space is for those who identify as that identity. And so that is very crucial, you know, to make it, to recognize the difference between those two. Um, and also to recognize, you know, for, for an example, there was, you know, an individual who, even though he, you know, was a white man, he wanted to co-lead the Black um, affinity space because he felt that growing up in a community that was predominantly Black allowed him to understand the Black experience to that point that he wanted to, to co-lead that space. And so the organization, that's a place where you need to step in and create and say these spaces are really rooted in the lived experience and that identity. And so it is not um, to assume the identity of communities of color, but rather to walk in your own lived experience. And that person would have been a great co-lead for, um, we have a, a white allies group who is examining, you know, dismantling privilege. That would have been a great space for that kind of leadership. So being clear as an organization is gonna be important in having um, the wisdom to be able to hold spaces as kind of sacred spaces. Um, and sometimes affinities are not enough. So, you know, when we are identifying that, you know, we, we do a lot of networking, we do a lot of support. If, if a woman reaches out to me and says, you know, I'm really unhappy in my current role, I really, I don't know that I, if I would stay with this organization beyond, uh, you know, the next six months, if I don't find a better fit, then I have to kind of try to, um, in advocacy, try to help them navigate and understand some of the spaces that are more psychologically safe than other spaces. Um, but when you're coming up into some situations where folks are really being psychologically harmed by the practices in those buildings, we enlist that elder circle who is aware of the different, you know, how to intercede and how to disrupt some of this toxic spaces that um, women of color may find themselves in. So you we need to recognize that 
structural changes have to be made to support folks who are having, um, you know, who are experiencing truly poor, um, you know, the lack of cultural competence, the lack of psychological safety. There are some spaces that are not conducive nor um, supportive of our BIPOC um, librarians, our BIPOC staff. So we have to have some, you have to have the heavies. You have to have a way and a process that's going to disrupt and intercede for folks. Um, and then speaking, and, and the other time I would say too, in retrospect, um, what ends up happening is that, you know, when the folks don't have an affinity group, we had some folks who, um, we had men of color, for example, reach out for help and support because there was not a sustained group that was really helping them. And so, you know, there have been times year there were at least five American men who had reached out at different points because of what they were experiencing was you know um, incredibly biased and so you know there is it's important to have a point of contact where people can get some support and advocacy um, but what you'll start to see is you, you'll see that in an inclusive space for um, you have to continue to amplify that we want more leaders to step up and to support marginalized identities and also recognizing that we have intersectional identities. I have members in the women of color group who are also members in two or three other groups because maybe they are a single mom and they want to be in the single parents group. Maybe they also want to be in um, the group for, you know, Latinas. And, and so they, we, we have, you can share membership across many different identities. Um, and then speaking truth to power, represent, representation and leadership matters. A lot of this work is um, supported from an executive culture and equity team um, at the district level. And so, you know, there is someone at a senior leadership level that is supporting this work in our organization. So um, those are kind of just, you know, to, to get you started in thinking about that. I, I also want to leave some time for questions and to support folks who, um, you know, might have had an idea of something come up and they just want to know um, and get some feedback on that. And so we can go to the next slide. And then if you want to be a part of the Women of Color Colorado group, there is a Facebook page. Um, we, you know, we've just grown. So I have members who are in California. I have members who are in Ohio, um, librarians who have reached out before just to say, you know, I, I work in not just a a library, but I work in a city that doesn't have a lot of representation. How can I build something like this? And I tell people, you know, you can begin with the people who may be in your organization, but you can reach out. In those kind of scenarios, you can think about, you know, who is in um, different fields, different backgrounds who might want to just, you know, we see each other. We, you know, we, we it resonates to connect. So, um Feel free to follow the page. Um, many Right now, especially, there's so many events that are virtual. It's an amazing time to build out your network and make connections with people um, from across you know, the country. Uh, internationally, we have members who are in our group who are in England, um, who are BIPOC folks who are British and you know, are interested in the mindfulness opportunities, but also in understanding more of what the experience of women of color are here in um, the US. So, I just want to invite um, any questions, any, um, if some things resonate with you. Uh, and so feel free to drop that into the chat. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> we do have some, some good questions coming in. And then, and one I've, I've seen repeated a couple times, um, oh, you don't have to put me on full screen, um, is how can an organization create um, facilitate or help create affinity groups for people who might be worried about outing themselves in some way? Mm, okay, so one of the things, um, you know, if, okay, so I would say this, if you have, a, a, if folks are afraid of identifying themselves in your organization, there already is a problem um, because it means that they've done it before or they've heard things and they felt unsafe and marginalized. So it is even kind of more important to think about what are the what's the ecosystem that this work is living in. So if the ecosystem has not been created to support um, affinity groups, it is it there's more work to be done maybe before you even get to affinity spaces. Like maybe what you're doing is is just providing an hour of time off to say I, if you're interested in this affinity group, 
we would like to, you know, invite you to, and, and having a staff member who already is a person who is trusted to maintain and hold safe spaces is a good person to invite to lead that because, you know, everything, trust is the foundation of all of this work. And where there is no trust, there is no community. And so I think that one, if, if folks have expressed that they don't feel safe, then there are things that need to be examined in terms of the entire system to examine and do some archaeology of self, as Dr. Uh, Yolanda would say, and um, I think that's Dale. And then to do some of that work so that you can uh, hold a space so that people can feel um, like they want to create something for your organization. Because if you know, and some of this work is created by people who are cultural strategists, people who see the connections within an organization and also care about the organization enough to do the work. So, you know, those things have to happen simultaneously. You have to, one, have done some of the work internally before you open up a space for affinity groups, um, but that shouldn't stop people from making one. So if you're a person of color or um, a gender expansive person or an LGBTQIA person and you know you need this space, create the space and, and invite some folks, even if you start with four or five people, and then over time that will be amplified. People will see that um, this is not a space to find and look and identify people so that you can target them for bias and for um, you know issues later, but instead that that, that homework is being done too. Great, thank you. Um, which I think is to really a great next question, which is how do organizations or how do people in the organizations um, create space for affinity groups during work hours, which I think kind of ties into that. Mm -hmm. We have lunch and learns. So, you know, if, um, if the schedule can be adapted to that, um, one, I, I do believe, you know, um, I do believe people need time. So if there is a way to comp back time, this is, this is you, you have to think about it in terms of this is a time for people to recover from 40 hours per text of harm. And so giving people time to um, be in community, be connected, to say, you know, um, on this uh, day that they would be doing, um, you know, needing that uh, they get just get an hour of comp time, you know, that you would say another day, please, we're, we're staffed, we have the, the front desk covered, um, please take this extra hour because I know that you're your lunch break in one of the affinity spaces. Um, so, you know, cultivating a sense of recognizing that a lot of your staff who have an identity that is marginalized and historically marginalized, um, this is a recovery practice that helps them bring themselves back to after maybe suffering um, some indignities, not just from maybe just an environment where they don't see a lot of representation and they don't feel a lot of support, but also that, you know, they could be experiencing bias from, from patrons to the library customers. You know, it's, it's a lot. So they need space and time to unpack that. Um, so again, but, but that goes back to the integrity piece until an organization is doing those acts people may not see the integrity in, in they're trying to accomplish. So um, organizations are trying to build trust and recognize that there is harm that is being experienced by some of their staff um, from, you know, different, uh, different identities. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think this is a really great question um, and point. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Um, but how can we impair, empower BIPOC colleagues to start and help um, run a few groups for them without um, doing what so often happens, which is putting BIPOC people in charge of diversity stuff? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I would say this, one of the things that you want to do is you recognize the power of co-creation. People do not know best what to do for any group until that group is centered in the design from the very beginning and invited to be a participant. In that. Um, one of the best things that I think you can do is spend it. If you stipend the work and you say, you know, either you are stipending it through additional, um, you know, additional pay or you know, we're saying this really matters to our organization. Um, and you also recognize that a person carries a talent as well as a social capital that is worth that is 
you are you are excited to even have them take on this role um, because of the skill set and the lived experience that they bring to this role. And, and that's really important in our field because we're a field that really relies on and sees the credentials of a person rather than looking at the power of their lived experience. And so there are a lot of um, staff who are completely under, you know, work has to be meaningful. And there's a lot of staff, incredible talents and could lead this kind of work who might not have the MLS, you know, who might be um, working in different sectors of the library and who might be, um, you know, so we want to recognize that, you know, some of the best community organizers who can build this kind of community and, and sustain it and maintain it um, are going to be people who have lived experience doing this kind of community um, building. And so our community builders, especially, you know, I think about um, in our Black community, you know, it's, there are elders and mamas who have worked in, um, you know, in churches and in, um, you know, I think about people who have done advocacy and activism for a long time, and they might not have a credential degree because of the historic, um, you know, lack of access to, you know, um, colleges, institutions, funding for that. So I think it's important to recognize that the set of skills that are required that build community are not always the ones that we control. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. And I think um, it's really something we have not historically done a really good job as looking beyond a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Really, building community is a is a is a is a valuable skill <laughs> that uh, yeah definitely should be appreciated and supported. Absolutely, yeah. and you know that goes back to even just honoring. I mean, I think that what ends up what we notice is that there's so many women of color, and it, you know um, because of, you know the women of color group, but who have done incredible work for years and have never been given a certificate. Um, a, 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 a round of applause who have not had this mentioned in meetings or newsletters who have, have had their work even to some degree co-opted and then put up as being this exemplar, but never being acknowledged like who's doing that labor. So I think that even having a, um, an affinity group that one of the things we're, you know, we had initially planned for the pandemic was to do a banquet just to, to give each other a round of applause, because oftentimes there is not a space that is uplifting that work. And, and so um, you know, celebrate, you can say, if you can, send an email, tell someone thank you for work that, that is known and unknown to you that they have been doing since this pandemic. Yeah, it's really important. Uh, I, so I think this is a oh, great question. Um, how do you, how would one find out if there are already affinity, group, affinity groups in their area or organization um, if they don't know about? That is a really good question. And you know what, I think, um, so for example, one of the we partnered with is that DISH Network has an African-American network of, uh, of, you know, an affinity group. And so we ended up partnering with them for some of our work around, you know, doing things for youth and for, um, you know, a, a youth organization that we work with. And so, um, one of the things is, I think you can just ask. And so it's a great, you know, for example, colleges and institu academic institutions, um, they may have a group that is already going on that you might want to join. But also thinking about even um, museum, there's like even to reach out and if you have a shared interest or you feel like this is a place would be a great um, organization to have an affinity group, asking the question can kind of be maybe that spark that gets them to realize this is really important. So um, not only do I encourage you to start your own affinity groups, but I encourage you to you know, hold other organizations accountable to doing it as well. Like we know that underrepresentation happens everywhere. We know that um, we have people who are going into fields who are early career um, you know, professionals and they might not feel supported. And that is, you know, once, we got our, our affinity group together and we had so many people from different backgrounds in the same space. It was amazing to me to realize we were all experiencing very similar, um, you know, very similar experiences. And so, you know, creating a space where people can, like I said, share their testimony and then realize they're not alone, that their testimony has been experienced by more people in the room than they can count. 
And um, that just, I can see the rest, like this, um, the exhale that happens when people are like, oh my gosh, like you have experienced that too. Like someone put, you know, an article on your desk saying that it's okay for people to use the N now. It's not a, an issue anymore. Like there are things happening that people would not believe ever, ever in life. And, and once people can get that off their chest to say like, this is what I'm dealing with. How do I cope? And then for other people to affirm their lived experience, to not make them like, you know, to not, um, because sometimes you can say something and people are like, that could not possibly have happened. Well, in affinity groups, people already know that probably did happen. And it probably happened a few weeks ago. So um, there, you don't have to defend or, or, or go through that process of having to explain your lived experience. People understand uh, what you may have gone through. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, that that, I, that distracted me enough that I forgot which next the question I had um, picked out. <laughs> um, I, so someone was wondering how you decided on the use of affinity as the word for your groups, the, the affinity groups, because um, the words we choose matter. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, that is what our district kind of put it forth as, as they were starting these affinity groups. And so this was four years ago. And I think, you know, you know, as you reclaim language, like it, um, it's, it's a different experience, you know, now, but we kind of internally just adopted it as our sisterhood. And so, um, which, you know, as I also, you know, just to be honest and transparent, also, think to myself, does that language exclude folks in my gender expansive community? How do I interrogate that um, and ensure that, you know, that it's a safe and welcoming space for and as inclusive as possible? And so I think to be in spaces where we can examine and interrogate um, a lot of intersectional kind of, uh, we talk about colorism, like there's things that we don't get a lot of opportunities to talk about in community in a, in a safe space where we can just um, deconstruct some of the ways that we, you know, oppress and, and even internalize oppression. And so, um, and all of this lends to really seeing the importance and modeling the importance of having a space to talk about what really matters and how we can improve every day in the ways that we show up for one another. Great. Um, do you have any tips or suggestions for people who are interested in starting um, affinity groups in there, you know, locally, um, including justification, for, you know, maybe to management or um, getting the resources they might need? Mm -hmm. I would say first, I think you need to think about the ecosystem that this work will live in. So if you're in an ecosystem where it is already so hardened in their practices that they want you to justify why you should have an affinity group, or they're uncomfortable with even using that language, or they're resistant to even setting up the space, then you, know, you might have to create it outside of that space first to come up with um, and do some do some data collection, do some, and you know, like do some building what it is that you really um, want to see embodied in that work. Because, you know, if I, I can't tell you to go out and that it's safe for you to, you know, pitch this and get that group going. And then all of a sudden um, have this organization not understand the importance and then some way undermine that work happening. Right. So, or that it becomes um, performative, like they want to put you on, a photo of your group on something or they but they don't want to do any of the work that really matters to making that group uh, stay, you know nourished and sustainable. So I would say first, you know, you can do kind of a air quality check, you know, in your organization and say, these are some things that I came away from this conference, seeing the power of um, and doing an a group. And if the first question you hear is, well, we don't want to um, we don't want to uphold racism by giving you a space to have a BIPOC group and then we don't have a space where there are, you know, people have encountered a, a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different environments that are, that our folks are surviving in right now. And I say surviving because you cannot thrive in a system that is set up that way. So you are surviving. So in, in an abolitionist way, you might have to go 
off campus to do this building and dining in the ways that you know are truly deeply rooted in integrity. And then you come back and you say, you know, one, these are the things that we need to have in order for us to change the historic nature of this, um, you know, of the system that is currently in place. And this is how it is dehumanizing and it is not uh, conducive to us thriving. And this is what it would look like for us to thrive. And so I've heard beautiful testimonies from folks, some folks who, um, you know, I've met with groups to consult them with just affinity groups and there are blessings and, and amazing things. I think Talia's group can speak to some amazing things that they were able to um, advocate for when they were rooted in what they needed and then um, to be resourced and to, to get that. So first, you know, do that air quality check, do that, you know, look at the ecosystem that people are currently um, in and then ask yourself, what do we need to thrive in this ecosystem? Is it that we need to have uh, resources poured in for us to you know, have folks, you know, have credit, um, you know, college courses paid for, or for folks to be able to um, develop their pro professional trajectory in a really meaningful way. So again, you, it's, a de it's about designing it, but all of us are working in a different model currently. And so I just would really encourage you to examine what is the ecosystem that you're currently in and what needs to change for that to be a place where you can thrive. Okay, great. We are at about three minutes left. So um, I think I heard you say you do consulting on this if people have questions. Yeah, I do support. I mean, my goal, I, I'm passionate about affinity work. I'm passionate about affinity groups. Um, I just know that the blessing that it has been in my life, we um, have co-led this group with uh, different folks who've had the capacity to do so over time. But now we have you know, there's five of us co-leading it because it's own. We have over 200 um, and some odd members. We have other people. We have more than 500 who follow the Facebook page. Um, and the gatherings and the connectivity that we've experienced is really healing spaces. So I hope that you um, feel excited about embarking on this journey. And I would just love to cheerlead and support and, and amplify um, what that looks like. Great. Great, thank you so much. This was really um, enlightening and I think a great segue into um, the rest of the for today. So um, I want to remind everyone that the next session is in 30 minutes. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.